LP plus norm of U uh, in LP. But this is one, this is zero, so we know that this is bounded by a constant C. Well, uh, let me take, in fact, here L plus one P, then I would have here W one P, but this doesn't change the argument, so again we have a bound by a constant. But now I know that because of the compactness of the uh, embeddings of Sobolev spaces, I know that the sequence UN uh, viewed as a sequence in WKP is compact, that is, there is a convergent subsequence. I will still denote this by UN, and this converges strongly into some, to some U infinity in WLP. So there, what I meant is L. Right, but our operator is a bounded one, so we can apply L to, so L U N converges to L U infinity. This is zero, so U infinity is again in the kernel of uh, L, which means that the sphere, the unit sphere in the space Ker L uh, is compact. And you know very well that if you take the unit sphere in a vector space and it happens to be compact, then this vector space is finite dimensional. So this is how the proof works. And what you see, uh, what we used in the proof was Sobolev embedding theorems and elliptic estimates. And that's uh, what is essential about uh, elliptic operators. Okay. Are there any questions to that? Yes? So why, why we have started with uh, you from uh, uh, this uh, intersection of the view uh, we, we didn't need to. Uh, it was just convenient uh, for me to start because we can, uh, you know, in the setting I described, we can apply L to functions in WLP only. On k plus lp, so uh, here I took k equals zero uh, or uh, k equals one to be more precise. But sort of uh, as I described this, uh, the uh, differentiability order here must be bigger than l. In fact, this is really not uh, important. We could have started here with any uh, dif differentiability degree, for instance, zero. Uh, but you, you would need to know, uh, you know, how to deal in this case. By the way, this elliptic estimate uh, is still valid in, uh, in this case when uh, k is uh, sort of negative, uh, but you need to know how to define the norm for negative case. Uh, it can be done.
So one more useful uh, generalization of the notions that we consider so, uh, so far is the notion of an elliptic complex. So what we have is uh, we have a complex that is uh, we consider sections of some bundle, say E1, into uh, maps, say a map L1 from sections of E1 into sections of E2, say L2 in gamma E3, and so on. So uh, let me take uh, a finite complex for simplicity that is gamma E k. So here is L k minus one, then zero. Uh, so assume this is let it be two star as a complex in the usual sense. That is, when we take L one, then L two, uh, we have zero. Uh, well, for any uh, sequence of two uh, maps, uh, you know. Uh, so assume that this is a complex, then uh, uh, this is called elliptic. So two stars is elliptic if the sequence of symbols, uh, that is what we have, is pi star E1, pi star E2, pi star E3, and so on, so pi star E k, and we have maps here, so sigma L1, sigma L2, sigma L3, and so on. If this sequence of symbols is exact. Right, in particular, for a very short complex, uh, if you have just pi star e to pi star f, so the exactness of this sequence means exactly that uh, the uh, symbol uh, of the uh, operator L is invertible. That is, uh, the operator L itself is elliptic. All right. Now, since we have a complex, we can define its uh, homology groups. Uh, so we have uh, Hj uh, of, well, let me skip the notation. So this is just the kernel of, uh, say, Lj divided by the image of Lj minus 1. So this is J's cohomology of two star. Now, uh, what I will also need is the notion of the formal adjoint, so Lj star. Uh, this is a formal a joint of Lj, which means simply that if I take the L2 scalar product of Lj S with any section T in L2, this is simply S Lj star T again in L2. And so you can prove that for any uh, differential operator, there is a formal joint operator, and this is again a differential operator of the same order. And with this notion at hand, we can define the corresponding Laplacian, delta j is uh, Lj star Lj plus Lj minus 1 star Lj minus 1. So that's if we are here in the complex, uh, what we do, we uh, go by L2 in here, say, and then we take the joint 
in here, and also in the other uh, direction. So we go first here, and then here. And so uh, the sum uh, of these operators is just delta j. And uh, an easy exercise is to show that this is an elliptic operator whenever our complex uh, two star uh, is an elliptic complex. So this is a, a simple exercise in linear algebra. So let me denote by hj the kernel of delta j. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So for j minus one, you, you have to go first in this direction, then take uh, OJ, j minus one. <coughs> so these are called harmonic sections. And the main theorem is uh, If M is compact, and our complex is elliptic, then the following holds. So uh, first of all, uh, the space of harmonic sections uh, is finite dimensional. Secondly, uh, S is a harmonic section uh, if and only if Lj of S is zero and Lj minus one star of S is zero. And the set claim and the main one is that we have a natural map from the space of harmonic maps into the J's cohomology group of the complex. Since you know, whenever we have a harmonic section, uh, it is uh, sort of closed, so we can take uh, its cohomology class. So S is mapped simply to the cohomology class of S. And the claim is that this is an isomorphism. <coughs> So the proof of this theorem is not really hard. Uh, I uh, uh, gave a proof in my notes, so uh, if you're interested, take a look. Uh, but this is really uh, sort of an elementary computations, computation uh, with what we have uh, done so far. But let me actually uh, give you an in interpretation uh, of this fact. So uh, what we have done is the following. Uh, so let, let me say, maybe uh, linear gauge theory. What we have is uh, we have a manifold C, which is, uh, let us take uh, this to be uh, C infinity uh, EJ. This is our uh, manifold. So the notation uh, suggests that uh, I refer to what we had in the very first lecture. Uh, and we have a group G which acts on this manifold. This is now C infinity E J minus one. And the action is, uh, you know, whenever you have S and G, you can send this to S plus L J minus one of G. So here, uh, clearly, S is an element in here, and G is an element in here. So we have an infinite dimensional manifold and an infinite dimensional group, and the group acts on this manifold. So we can, uh, right, we can ask, uh, and we, uh, we also have a map, Lj, from C into, V, and V is just uh, taken to be 
C infinity Ej plus one viewed as a trivial G representation. In particular, any point here uh, is a fixed point of the action, uh, but I can take, say, the origin here, and I can consider the moduli space. So I can take L j inverse of zero, and I can divide this by the gauge group. And what you immediately realize, what we have here is a j's uh, cohomology group of the complex just by definition, and this is our moduli space. Now, because everything is linear, we know that this is uh, a vector space, so the only invariance that we have uh, is a dimension of this uh, space. And so I could uh, define Bj to be the dimension of Hj. So let me consider one perhaps more concrete example uh, where we take the Durham complex. So here is an example. So what we have, we have a manifold, say a compact manifold uh, oriented, so oriented Riemannian compact, and we have the Durham complex uh, that is in omega zero m, in omega one m, and so on. Now, uh, what we know is uh, that this is uh, an elliptic complex. And so uh, by what we have done so far, we know that the chase cohomology group uh, of this complex is finite dimensional, right? And as we have defined, Bj is the dimension of the chase cohomology group. Uh, this is our invariant. But of course, we know that uh, this complex, so the cohomology groups here, H, J, are just the RAM cohomology groups, and uh, B, J is just the J's petty number. Which is, by the way, an interesting invariant of a, a topological manifold, uh, as you all uh, surely know. Uh, and this is what happens uh, more or less uh, generally. If you have uh, a linear elliptic complex, uh, the invariants that you can get uh, are topological invariants of your manifold. So this is not quite what we are uh, looking for in gauge theory. We are uh, looking for somewhat more interesting invariants, but this requires uh, a nonlinear version of the theory. So what we, we will do in the next lecture uh, will be an abstract setup for uh, nonlinear Fred Holm maps, and then we will go to the Zyberg Witten gauge theory. Okay, so that's all I wanted to tell you today. Are there any questions? All right, then, see you tomorrow.